Uh, online folks, I'm Aaron McLaren. I'm the director of the audio engine at Epic Games. I was asked uh, if we would be interested in presenting at AES uh, for this meeting, and I suggested Phil would be a great uh, person to talk. Phil uh, has been with us for how many years? Five, four years? and has been instrumental in the development of a lot of our core audio engine tech that uh, is very exciting and um, envelope pushing. And uh, his background is in uh, digital signal processing, electrical engineering, and um, has worked for approximately 10 years in uh, machine learning uh, <laughs> applications and audio audio render uh, audio engine or audio development not in, at all related to games and uh, four years ago I managed to convince him to come over and join us in the game world and he's brought in a great perspective that is unique in video games and uh, he's been a pleasure to work with and uh, a uh, significant technical technical leader for the team, but also a spiritual leader. I'd say uh, Phil, as you will see in his talk, <laughs> is very chill, and uh, he will uh, sort of welcome you into this space, and I think by the end you'll uh, see why Phil's awesome, and hopefully you'll have a better idea of how MetaSounds works. So thanks a lot, Phil. That was a great intro. Thanks, really. Really, I don't think I had that nice of an intro at my wedding. That was <laughs> wonderful. Um, yeah, so I'm Phil. Uh, I work at Epic Games. Um, I got into audio probably like a good chunk of y'all did. Uh, I wanted to be a rock star. I decided to record my own music, get a band. We made some albums. And then we came and realized that like there's no way we're going to be rich and famous. So uh, I went to school instead to learn about programming audio. Um, after I went to school, actually I went to school with Aaron, uh, MAT at University of California, Santa Barbara. That's the Media Arts and Technology program. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I went to work for Grace Note doing machine learning on music, analyzing audio, analyzing songs, figure out the chords, the beats, melodies, things like that. Uh, but my heart was always in making sound. Um, it's just working with people who are creative and artists is fulfilling in a kind of a deep way uh, versus I think for machine learning it's more like you're making products for Spotify and things like that. Um, so that's why I jumped up and, and jumped on board when Aaron gave me the opportunity to work at Epic. Um, and what I want to, so I've been here four years and it's been a lot of learning and I want to share some of that learning and it's been some developing too. So this talk, it's going to start um, with the forest. Like it's going to be real broad scope. We're going to talk about game audio in general and we're going to slowly get more and more narrow down like past the trees to like the little leaf and we're going to look at the little corner of the leaf. Like we're talking really far in. So if you're sitting there and you're getting bored halfway through and you're like, when is this guy going like, to get to like, the more general stuff? It's not going to happen. It's, it's only going one way. So um, just give you that as a precursor. Uh, so, so let's start with, though, with like game audio. What is it? Because I know a lot of folks here, now maybe here in this room, a lot of people know game audio. Uh, folks online, I think we have a very wide variety of of audio backgrounds coming up to this. So I want to make sure we all have a good starting ground on what game audio is. Um, OK. There's some important tenets to game audio that kind of differentiates it from many other audio, most other audio expertise. One is really the interactive bit, OK? You're not working on something that then gets played verbatim. Okay, it's not movies, it's not uh, recording discs. Uh, maybe a little bit more like live music where there is a performance aspect to it. It's it interactive from the musician standpoint. Uh, but games is very much interactive from the person playing the game. And it's not just a simple musical interaction. Not that musical ac interactions are simple in any way, but it's not so straightforward. It is things happening 
sounds getting triggered that are supposed to help with the subconscious vision of what's going on. It's changes so that you're really not breaking the kind of imaginary world that you've created. And all this has to happen in real time. So you throw some things out the door. Like you, you can't be doing, you just can't look in the past. There's you know, some laws of physics at play here. The other big bit, I think, from a lot of the other audio uh, expertises is that we are working with other teams, other professions, other expertises, not just in, well, we're working with them in a professional way, and we're working with them in a systems way, and we're also sharing a technological space. So we talk to people who program physics and graphics and things like that. Um, but we also have sound that interacts with physics, that interacts with just gameplay type things, people who design games. It's a whole you know, world unto itself. It's like, what are the mechanics of games? And so our interactive system for audio is interacting with them. Sometimes it's driving them. Sometimes they're driving audio. And it's all back and forth. And so it's a very dynamic system that's going on. And even within that, when you're putting this on a box that someone holds and someone plays, you're sharing space. Um, and so you do need to be performant. You don't get the whole CPU to yourself. Maybe you get one. Like if there's 32, they'll give you one. The, the other ones are very greedy. Audio is usually, we, we have to fight for our you know, CPU cycles and our memory. Um, so that's, that's a lot of like the challenges of game audio and the excitement of game audio. I mean, really this interactive and procedural bit, that is so exciting to me and really what drew me to game audio. Uh, and so a lot of this stuff in the game audio world is gonna be powered by an audio engine. It's gonna be your friend in this great big mess. Okay, so a, an audio engine, let's, if we look at it like really simply, the audio engine is, really just managing the state of all the sound playing back. So this is a very dumbed down audio engine, right? Uh, it's got some number of voices. It's got to play multiple voices at the same time. So it's a lot like a sampler. That's the analogy that we're going here. So folks who are familiar with like musical samplers, um, it has to mem manage like how much memory those things are using and then what state things are in, if they're playing, they're stopping, they're going. And then it, usually they come with some tools um, to help like make it dynamic, you know, to make it look, feel real. Like audio's job is, is different in lots of different ways. I think people who do sound design know this way better than I do. I'm kind of a bad sound designer, but I kind of like to pretend I'm okay and know what I'm talking about. Um, so sometimes you have audio that's right in your face that's doing something you know vocals maybe someone's talking to you sometimes you have background music sometimes you have things that are just like in the background trying to give you this sense of reality the sense of like that you're actually submerged in this world it's like a subconscious experience of sound and so some of the simple tools you get is like a variation that'll happen where you'll say okay i need footsteps but i don't want it to be the exact same one you know, you need to suspend the disbelief that this is just a video game. You have to kind of make them feel like, oh, that's actually what it sounds like when someone walks on concrete. And so an audio engine will have all sorts of, not just for that kind of effect, but it'll have all sorts of bells and whistles to smoke and mirrors, make it feel like a real world experience. So, when we talk about the audio that does get played in the game, it's not just playing back a sound when something happens. You know, when Mario hits the coin, you know, bling! Uh, it's, it's a lot more than that. There's, you think of these things called audio objects. You can think of that object in a lot of ways. One way you can think about it is spatially, right? So this object is, it can move, you know, farther away, it reverberates more maybe. It's, uh, it's quieter, things like that. But really this object is a collection of intermingling sounds. Like uh, imagine a machine gun playing, right? You can't, in a video game, you can't just have machine gun sound and it have be one wave that just plays machine gun sound, right? Uh, there are lots of elements to that. You need to be able to extend that sound or make it short. 
There are other aspects to it. You know, there's the machine gun, that's the ta 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 There's also the tinkling of the shells, casing shells falling on the ground. And there's a start, and there's a stop, and there's a continuation, and maybe you have different machine guns, and they go at different speeds, and then you let go of the trigger, and you hear the whoosh. So this audio object can sometimes take a lot of scripting to control all these little pieces and how they interact. Even though from the game layer, you're just saying, start shooting, okay, now stop shooting. The audio object has to do a lot of dancing around to really make um, a dynamic and believable sound. Okay, so, so we're kind of getting a little bit deeper. I'll try not to get too deep yet uh, into like what this audio engine is solving. So one, it's giving you tools to make these audio objects. It's giving you tools to do either maybe somewhat realistic physical calculations for reverber reverberation, maybe smoke and mirrors kind of stuff. Um, but it's also sharing the space with all these other processes. You know, the, it's sharing the space with the network connection to, so you can see where the other player is running around. It's sharing the CPU space with graphics, with physics, all those other teams. Uh, and so we have to be nice. And so one big way we have to be nice is with memory consumption. And so an audio engine, you're going to have uh, runtime tools. You're going to have tools to help with disk footprint. Uh, most of that is all just compression codecs. And you're not just going to have one. It's not just going to be like, hey, we use MP3. Maybe if you have a really good codec. There are some good codecs out there. But MP3 isn't the one that we would use. But anyways, usually you need a little bit of a variety of them. And then when that stuff comes in, you need to have a streaming technology to make sure that that audio comes in smoothly, that you're not using, you know. If you have like some two hour long like symphony that you want to have play through your game, you can't, you can't just load the two hour symphony in memory. Um, so streaming is a huge important part of that. Um, so you get a lot of the similar stuff that you'll get with maybe DAWs or something handling multiple streams coming in. Um, and then some of the similar stuff you have with just general media playback where you have lots of different codecs. And with codecs, you have a whole, like I said before, you have a collection of them that you can use. Perceptual codecs, that's like your MP3s, AUG. Uh, these are the things that you say, hey, there's that loud sound, and you can't hear the tiny soft sound after, so you throw that information away. You, you hear a loud frequency here, but you can't hear the quiet frequencies next to it because your ears just can't. And so you throw that information away. Um, so you'll get a lot of those in games. And then you have other ones that are maybe like, well, the problem with those perceptual ones is, remember, we're still fighting CPU. So to turn that squeeze down thing back into your nice full audio, that's not always that cheap either. Sometimes that's a FFT. Sometimes it's a big FFT. Sometimes it's lots of them. Uh, and that can be problematic depending on how many sounds you're playing at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you also have time domain codecs, uh, ADPCM, PCM. These are, I don't know, old, long-lived codecs uh, that are just maybe less good at memory, but they're very fast. And then you have hardware codecs. So this is like if you have a console, PlayStation, Xbox, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to have their own little chip that does their own little codec. Sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's not. You know, sometimes it's, it'll play back the audio without using up the CPU. Sometimes it won't have the controls that you want. But this is the world that audio engines live in. Um, and then, so you built this tool. It's made for playing audio in games. And now they say, let's uh, ship it. Let's, let's get it to work on a bunch of different platforms. And let me tell you, these, all these platforms are not equal. So uh, desktop PC for games is usually the, the nicest. Uh, but also, uh, you know, brand new consoles. Yes, get to try out all the new tricks. Uh, but you basically have to build something that can, where you can author one piece of content and translate it to all these different things, some of which are basically like a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> you know? It's, it's a difficult, difficult thing to pull off. Uh, but that's what, that's what the challenge is, is building tools that can go through all of that. Because w when you build one of these games, th maybe if you're just doing it with your buddy in your garage, you know, or I guess in your basement, I don't know where you build these things, um, 
it's not so bad. But once you get to a big team, uh, you're talking about lots and lots of content. Um, Fortnite over here, that's uh, epic. If that's hopefully everyone knows, it, epic makes Fortnite. Um, they, it was something like half a million assets. Now those aren't all sound waves, right? But like sound related assets, that, like, that's a lot of little pieces of information to manage. That's a lot of people working together on that. So you need a tool that can span uh, multiple teams working together, collaborating on this. And if you've seen, you know, back in the old day, you'd make a game and you'd ship it on a disc and then you'd kind of be done. And then they started like, okay, here's your update disc or here's your downloadable extras. And now it's just like every couple of weeks we're going to update the game. So, so it's a constant iterative process. And so you need tools that can reflect that. Um, okay, so that is, was kind of my take on game audio after four years. When I started, I had come from a place where I really liked like DSP synthesis and I wanted to help make more of that. And I think a lot of people that I was working with wanted to do that too. Because we all did stuff like Max MSP, Super Collider. I don't know. Um, raise of hands if you used, let's say, Max, Super Collider, Chuck PD, any of those. Okay, good. Okay, so we have, or, or even uh, hardware modular synthesis, I think, is another totally legit kind of thing. So, th I mean, that to me is that's the space of, of, of creativity that we want to explore and to make more accessible in a, a game environment, which is, like I said, super interactive, super procedural. Um, and of course, we had to work with all the other constraints that you have for games. And what we came up with was this thing called meta sounds. Um, we were making the metaverse. It was the sound for the metaverse, the meta sound, yada, yada. That's how <laughs> that name came. We tried a lot of different names. I. This is probably the best, you know. <laughs> um, and so what I was going to do is, uh, originally what I was going to do is some demos, but what I ended up actually doing is just recording some demos. And what I'll do is they have sound in them, but I'm going to kind of talk over them while they're happening. Um, and the first one I'm going to do is, let's see if I can get up. This is like, I wanted to get a good... <laughs> Oh, that was a beautiful sound. Okay, so um, this was not made by me. This was made by one of our sound designers. It's kind of, this is a big sound. This is a big one, okay? I, I try to clean it up a little bit. I'm sorry, it's a little messy, you know, if you look at this graph. But this is meta sounds as it is. And remember when I was talking about the machine gun? This kind of shows you some of the layering aspects of it. So each one of these, someone kind of layered this and we're going to kind of explore some of those layers. Here's the full sound. Which ends up having a lot of different components. So if we just look at maybe one layer, kind of this is a great exploration, like what is this layer? Because I didn't label them. Okay, we have a charge up. That's all done through like raw synthesis. This isn't like reading wave files. Um, we have some sort of like clanky, getting the gun out kind of thing. This is towards the end of the sound. All right, like the final blast at the end. And what you're seeing here is really the layers, the timing, and what Metasounds is offering you is not only like a, a, DSP, a DSP synthesis framework, but a way to kind of orchestrate all those sounds, their timing, and to do it really accurately, uh, down to the sample timing. So then we hear it all together again. Okay. Great. So um, before I get, let's see, 
I'm going to pause the next one when I bring it up so I can show you some stuff. So that was cool. That was like a whole thing built together to make this super big laser gun. I have a question for you, Phil. Yeah, yeah, shoot away. Is, can I get that medicine somewhere? You can. Okay, so um, UE5, free to download, uh, free to play around with. And um, I don't know all the licensing, but you, you can use it without having to pay a penny unless you start making a bunch of money. I'm not a lawyer, don't ask me exactly what, but you can use it. So there's a sample project called Lyra. It's a whole game. It's got all the sounds and um, it's got a ton of meta sounds. So you can open those up, you can peel them apart, you can look at the assets. You can probably even use the assets, don't quote me on that. Um, and that'll be a great like exploration ground for, for meta sounds. And that gun, if you ever play Lyra, it's just a demo project you're like running through, you're fighting stuff. You get to the end, there's this giant robot, and this giant robot is powering up this giant laser to shoot you. That was the sound that they had for that. So it was a very marquee sound. You got one more? No, uh, just slight correction. That one is from a thing called Ancient Game. Oh, yeah. There's two no, sample projects. Yeah, products. my bad. You're right. That's from Ancient Game. Anyways, we got lots of sample projects you can check out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lyra is another sample project that I think is um, more up to date, I, I would say. Uh, it doesn't have that exact sound in it, but it has a lot of other sounds. All right, so here, let's see, is this coming up? Ooh. Hope that doesn't happen again. Okay, so let's see if I can turn this up a little bit. These are kind of quiet. They're gonna be. So what I wanted to show in this demo is just like, okay, bread and butter, let's make some footsteps. <laughs> That is. Is that me or is that something else? Yeah, I know. Let's see if I can pause this. I can't really see it. Am I on the right button? No. <laughs> what do you think it was? Don't be. For those online, we had a malfunction in the in-house PA, not the brought-in one. Oh, I'm, I'll be very happy if it didn't go out there. We went online. <laughs> it was loud. All right, all right. Back to the show. Uh, is it? Me? Huh. Maybe if, I don't know if anyone online can comment as to whether they're hearing that horrible sound? Uh, yes, we can, but it's not directly through. We're hearing it through microphones. Okay. Huh. All right. Try not to jinx anything. Um, so this is the Unreal Editor, and I'm just playing some sound waves here that are basically just footsteps. I don't know. Someone went with a microphone next to their foot. <laughs> Gosh. Greg, can we unplug the speaker or something? Is it just the one? Stand on a road case. No, oh, there you go. It's out of two. Sorry, folks, a couple technical difficulties. Yeah. Uh, hey, Dan? Yeah. Dan, this, yes. Not sure if you could see the chat. Do you want to share your screen instead of me spotlighting you? Uh, <clears throat> I am sharing my screen, I thought. And uh, I cannot see chat without everybody else here seeing it, unfortunately. Okay. So, no. Okay. I'm going to try sharing screen. All right. Huh. Well, yeah, it's, uh, there's no way, I believe, they can make any more of that 
Uh, that's all right. You know, one time when I was younger, I was recording a comedy show. I forget who it was. I was like, hadn't recorded it yet. And I set up my recording equipment and then I like, I walked away while the comedian did their thing. This is like some guy who travels around. I think he had like Comedy Central, like a, uh, you know, a spotlight event. So he's a big deal. And then I got yelled at while I was sitting outside. Get back in here. And I, my system was doing exactly that for his comedy show right when I was recording it. So it happens. <laughs> it's happened to me. Mm. All right, let's hop to it. This is uh, the Unreal Editor. This is how you make games. <laughs> um, so these are all little sound assets that I had. And I was, I was playing them in this video, just little examples of what the, what the footsteps sounded like. Um, they were just like. And what we're going to do now is kind of very methodically build up uh, kind of footsteps using meta sounds. Uh, and this is just me. You know, I wouldn't say this is like recommended practice completely because I am, again, a programmer, not a sound designer. So I, you're going to see me like limp and struggle through this process. Um, so this is the meta sound editor. Up here on the top left, you got inputs and outputs, and you see these input pins and output pins. This is your graph. This is where you do all your data flow, where you tell what to connect to what. That on play, it's a trigger. It happens when it starts, and then you tell it when it's done. This is for sounds that stop. Some sounds don't stop. Some sounds go on forever, but this one stops. And then you have an audio output and information, yeah, up here on the left. And so what we're going to do is pull out the um, bread and butter wave player node. So this is kind of nice compared to lots of other audio synthesis stuff. Like waves are handled really smoothly and easily and streamed in. And you don't have to do any special loading or buffering on the side or, or anything. You just tell it. So this is the wave player. It's got quite a, it's kind of a full featured wave player, but basically this little sample accurate trigger happens when it's to start it and when it's done, it hits that one and then it sends out audio and I'm just picking one of those footsteps. Okay, it's real quiet. Let's turn it up a little bit. So now I'm just playing one footstep. I'll see if I can crank it up even more on the screen. Um, all right. So, oh yeah, actually maybe I shouldn't because I think what I did in the video right here is I said, oh, it's quiet. Let me turn it up. <laughs> And I'm adding a little gain layer. So this is this pink stuff's audio, right? So I'm just saying, hey, please multiply this audio by some much larger number. There you go. Okay, sounds good. So with MetaSounds, you can make new inputs. You can say, okay, so my input to my sound isn't just start playing. It's also, okay, let's make um, something that makes it louder. So I just added a gain because it needed a gain stage on it. And um, we do have some nice little like knobs, sliders. I, everyone loves their knobs and sliders. Uh, so this one's going to be a dB slider. And we'll let it play. I might jump ahead a little bit here if I need to. Um, and maybe I'll just describe some of the other parts of the graph too. So all your graphs are here. You'll have details over here for kind of configuring stuff. And you can, the graph will react live. You have a play button way up there. Um, kind of everything you need to get started. Okay. So we were playing with one, it was just playing the same foot sound. And like we said, we need some variety. I only have four samples for my stepping on concrete. Um, so I'm going to make another input and I'm going to grab all of those concrete ones, put them in like in a little array. And that's going to be represented by this little node over here, this input node that, has, that says waves. Okay. Um, so I add them all in and then I need to just say, okay, why don't we just randomly pick one? Every time we play, let's, let's randomly pick a new one. Um, you can't connect this group of waves to that single wave because one's a group of wave, one's a single wave. You have to tell it, like, how do you pick one? Oh, okay. I'll take randomly, I'll grab one. We have this whole set of library of nodes. 
um, that do all sorts of crazy stuff from raw kind of DSP synthesis to effects, compressors, limiters, um, lots of different wave player type stuff, lots of logic that's sample ag accurate logic so that you can build things to happen exactly when you want them. So you can really, I'll show you maybe on the last example where you can, you can basically play with this boundary between events and kind of timbre where maybe at a slow rate it sounds like an event, but at a fast rate, it starts to, when it gets down you know, to 20 hertz or something like that, it really starts to feel like a timbre. But let's look at this graph. So I have um, an array of those footsteps coming in. I randomly pick one, and then I play that one. And it's all triggered from here. And then a little pitch shift kind of uh, can sometimes add a little cheap poor man's variety too. All right, I'm going to stop that one and just go to the next video. So we've made our little footstep player. I can't really see my mouse. Let's see if this works. There we go. Next on the docket. So there's my little meta sound that said random wave player. Uh, and so Lyra is this, I stole some of these assets from Lyra. Lyra is, you can use it, you can, it's kind of a free demo project. They're robots, right? So they're walking around, but they also have this like whoosh, whoosh kind of sound that goes along with them. So I want to be able to layer these two. And I already had something that could play the footsteps. And the neat thing is, you can see my random wave player here. So you create one, it, you create a meta sound, you can use that anywhere else. It's just like another subgraph that you can use many, many different times in, in your thing, in your uh, sound, in other meta sounds. And here you saw, like when I played it, it still played those footsteps, but I can override that input. I can go ahead and give it something else to play. So I'm going to call that one footsteps. Let me. I'm going to maybe see if I can do the playback speed a little bit faster. OK, here we go. This is, this is how you work. This is how you get things done. You just do it at one and a half speed. Uh, and so now I'm taking those other sounds, that whoosh, 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 and I'm reusing that same subgraph that I made that just plays waves randomly and kind of picks a random wave from a group and then gives it a little bit of pizzazz with uh, pitch shift. And I'm going to play both of them at the same time. After I set up all the inputs here, this is, I know there's a faster way to do this, but again. Drag the array. See, I told you, there's a faster way to do it. Um, OK, so let's listen to that one. Yeah, it is a bit sped up, so you, you don't get quite the, I'm sorry that we're dealing with VLC's, you know, time-stretching algorithm here. So now we're setting it up. So on this top node, we're going to play all the footsteps that were just like the feet hitting the ground. On the bottom one, we're going to play those um, kind of robot sounds, and then we need to mix them together. So we'll add a mixer node here that takes in both inputs and uh, spits them out. And just the neat thing about MetaSounds is you can, if you have like, if there's a little green dot, if there's a knob you want to turn, all you have to do is you drag off of it and you connect a knob to it. This is a lot like, you know, Max MSP style stuff. If there is a number, it can be modulated. All right, so I think I just futz through this graph for a while. I get to the end. Ah, yeah, there's one other element that I do here. So I didn't want them to play at the same time. I wanted the, the robot sounds to come maybe a little bit later. So I add a delay. And this is, these delays are nice because they're to the sample. You know, so if, if I'm at 48 kilohertz, um, 
and I do a second delay, it's going to be 4, 48,000 samples exactly before it starts the next wave. So you can do cool concatenative synthesis tricks uh, if that's your jam. Let's see. All right, let's go to the next one. So then we'll have, end up having this like nice um, little, on oh, full screen, that's why I can't stop it. There we go. So now we have something that's mixed those two sounds together, right? And that's called footstep over there. It's our footstep medicine. But I have these ones that were for stepping on glass, and I want to be able to like just uh, use the exact same graph, but just change the inputs. Just change what wave files it's using. Because really, uh, a metasound is a topology. It's a data flow. It's, it's a signal flow th thing. And it, sure, we pack in data with it. Um, but really, what we're doing is defining like how sound I is supposed to interact. And I'm going to go back here and just pause. OK. Here's the little trick. It's this idea of a preset. So this is where you don't even have to look at the graph. You don't have to know anything about audio, DS well, you have to know something about audio. But you don't need to know about like how to hook up MetaSound DSP nodes. You can come in and say, please do this, but change the pitch. Please do this, but use these different uh, audio samples. Um, and so, and you can create as many presets as you want, and it'll just allow you to kind of twiddle with the outputs. So that's what we're going to do in this little video here. We take our footsteps. I right-clicked it. Makes a footsteps preset. And all my goal in here in this one was to do the exact same thing, but use a different input. As you can see, it has all the inputs and outputs. And if you double-click on it, you can go into the nodes. But really, all we care about is this at this point. And this is how you scale up your production. This is how you get one person who really loves to sculpt technically a sound and another person who really just needs to pump out a lot of content. They can just look at this view, add in all their sounds, and all of a sudden have um, multiple variations. If you need another variation for a new kind of thing that someone's walking on, you just record some different recordings of footsteps. Use there. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to inform Phil of a feature that exists, because he clearly doesn't know. And I would like to know, let everybody else know. If you, in the content browser, select like 10 variants, you can grab them all and just drag them onto the array all at once. So you, so you don't need to do it one by one like Phil's doing. This is true. I work on the core of MetaSounds, <laughs> not the editor layer, just so everyone knows. <laughs> that is not my strength. Um, and so this is me just twiddling with it, kind of, you see, you're just really messing with the inputs and outputs and tuning it to your liking, not having to rewire anything in the graph. And the last video I'm going to show you is just kind of a music application. Now, this is not, this is music in quotes. It's not good music. This is supposed to be, supposed to be just a demonstration of it, because I, I pieced it together kind of last second. Um, but we do it just to show a lot of the tools we have for like raw synthesis, uh, and to kind of show off what our sample accurate triggers can do. I'm just going to add, um, see so we have a saw, and I'm going to modulate. No, I think I'm just doing the gain there. I'm going to fast forward through this a little bit get to where the graph is starting to go, look more complete. Okay, so I have a saw and I want to play it, um, but now I need to make some notes. So first, if you know your modular synthesis, that saw is just going to make saw sounds. It's going to go forever. Um, so we're adding an ADSR envelope on top of it. Uh, the way you apply an ADSR to a signal is you multiply them together. It's an amplitude modulation kind of effect. And this is how you would do it in MetaSounds. Um, off screen a little bit to the left is this thing called the trigger repeat. All that's going to do is kick off an event at a, like a evenly spaced 
time. And we're saying how much time between those triggers? We're using just a, a BPM counter, so it's going to do it every beat. Okay. And now for my ADSR, I also need to trigger it to release, right? So we trigger the attack, it sustains, I have to tell it to stop. So I have a little delay, and I have, okay, now it's a one second delay. It's got to be shorter than that. Now I say, oh, I'm not really hearing it. Well, then I look over here at my other ADSR settings, and I realize that my release time is set to a second, and so that's way too long. Um, <coughs> And all these inputs, again, just to remind you, they're modulatable. So if you wanted to hook a real-time signal to it, you can. Let me speed up this one, too. So now we have a live BPM rate that we want. And slowly but surely, we're building more and more kind of controls, and it's starting to sound like maybe it's an instrument that we could actually do something with. All right, I'm going to fast forward a little bit more, see where my imagination took me. Okay, so we're starting to add in some musical stuff. We have musical scales built in. And we can pick a note out of that musical scale, um, 0 to 12. And then now I'm just adding it to kind of pitch shift it up because it's a MIDI note, basically. Turn that MIDI note into a frequency. And now we have something that's somewhat musical. Okay, so now let's give it a little depth. Let's give it a little bit of interesting timbre. We're going to take a filter and we're going to modulate that cutoff frequency. Um, we have a lot of LFOs. These work at kind of float rates, so it's um, maybe 100 times a second that value will get updated versus pink is your audio. That's going to get updated every sample. And now let's give it a little space. Uh, so I switched my Metasound to a stereo. Before it was just a mono. Um, you can really have, I think we support mono stereo, all 5171, quad even. I don't know if anyone has a quad receiver at home. Is it digital? Do they? I don't know if they make digital versions of them. But yeah, I got, my dad has a quad. And so we just add a couple delays. We're going to add a little bit of spatialization to this thing. Or not spatialization, but space, let's say. And my delays are a little too long. So as you can see, it's, it's iterative. It's fun. If you get your hands on it and you haven't tried it yet, it's, you know, sky's the limit. Oh, yeah, and here's the last thing I want to show you. So like I said, how our, our triggers are sample accurate, I can take that BPM and I can turn it really high. I can turn it to the point where it's almost turning into its own different sound, like it's almost a frequency at that point. Um, and that's one of the, I think, the really fun things about about metasounds and the architecture. That's a pretty unique aspect, too. Uh, you don't see that type of sample accurate stuff while not just tanking your CPU. Um, you can do sample accurate and tank your CPU pretty easily. All right, so that, that's the end of the videos here. Let me get rid of all these guys. Let's see if that goes away. I make you guys disappear. Oh yeah, there you are.
All right, back to the show. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what Metasounds can do. I want to break down here how it's built, what the guts are like. Uh, you know, for me, this is the exciting part. That's me. I'm into this stuff. Um, it's going to get a little technical, uh, maybe a lot. There will be a tiny, itty bit of code at the end. Not much, but just an itty bitty itty bit. Uh, but these are the problems we had to solve. It had to be an interactive DSP system, and, uh, fast as in um, computationally fast, reasonably. Um, also kind of fast to iterate on. Robust. You can't ship a game and have it break and break little kids' ears. They're little kids. They've got special ears. They can hear everything. You want to be nice to those ears. So we do have to make sure we're not just breaking things. Um, but also, it's, a, it's an artist's tool in the end, so it, it needs to have express. It needs to be, not be so frustrating that you just don't use it. And surprisingly, that comes down to real low-level architecture stuff. Um, for one, we had to make a decision, like, what, what's, our, what's our model for synthesizing? Uh, and, and we came to flow graphs. Now, Max MSP already has this, Super Collider kind of has it. A lot of different folks have it. We're not the first ones to come up with flow graphs. Um, but they are, and there's a reason, because they're good. Uh, you know, if you work in a studio, you kind of understand it already. You take the audio with this, you plug it in there, the audio goes through that cable and it goes into there. Um, so I think for audio, it is a natural space to be because we're so used to dealing with audio equipment. Um, but also, I, the other big th reason why we went with like a DSP flow graph is this kind of fundamental belief that sound designers can do this and be expressive and can be more expressive if they're feeling comfortable modifying a DSP flow. Like that, that, maybe it's complicated, maybe it's hard, but maybe it's super powerful at the same time. Okay, so in Metasounds, you see this all the time. You've got nodes, and you got little things with arrows pointing down. Real quick, the nodes, this is like flow graph 101. Um, nodes do things to data, edges, flow data, they kind of show where things connect, okay? Um, nodes have inputs, outputs, that's how you connect them together, and it also describes like how do they, what do they expose to the outside world? Uh, some big fancy words, directed acyclic, graph is actually not that hard, graph is just because it's like a graph with arrows and stuff. Directed means it's got arrows, so data flows in a direction, you can't just have audio going willy-nilly everywhere it wants. Uh, but acyclic, this one is like no feedback is maybe another way to talk about it. You know, if you hold your guitar up to the amp and it starts squealing, you know, that, that's, a, that's too chaotic, that's too, it's an unstable system. And we can't have that in, in our games. And also it's very computationally expensive to solve that. And it's very easy to screw it up if you allow it. So a cycle would be like node C comes back and points into node B, and then you can make like a circle with your arrows, right? So we said, can't do that for a host of reasons around speed and safety and stability. So if we look at these nodes, you kind of saw this before, they're modular. Um, both, they can be in C++ or you can write them in like those assets like I showed in the demo and they look the same. You can, you can reuse them the same. They just have inputs, outputs, they got a name. Um, it could be really messy, or it can be really clean. You don't have to care. And you can use them, and you can compose them, nodes and nodes and nodes, and patches and patches connected to each other. Patches like a, a generic meta sound that doesn't necessarily play, uh, but it's just like does some functionality, has inputs, outputs. Uh, but it's just another way to represent a node. And and really, a lot of this is around like simplicity and expressivity. So this is not only just like, a, you know, can I make the software work? It is, can someone use this and not get mad at it? And can they organize their own stuff into subgroups and things like that? 
And lastly, we needed something. In, in the game world, you're really about, it. Unreal Engine is an engine that other programmers and not just programmers, other companies, artists, groups, use it to make their own games. So they are programming on our programming, right? So they probably don't want to just use what we give them. They want to put their own spin on it because it can't just look, everyone can't make the same game. So extensibility is super important in games. And so if you want to extend a menace on, you can take your fancy weird wild node, you can, if you have some special effect with some special sauce that no one knows how to do, you can put it in a Metason. You can write a, like one CPP file, plop your algorithm in there, and it'll show up as a node. And then you can use that in a million different scenarios. You can hook it up to a million different things. Um, and so we really went, like that was uh, like a, Super high priority for us. So you can make your own nodes, you can make your own data types. Let's say you want to do like a neural, you want to do like neural network synthesis, right? You know, one of these fancy things. You could put that in a node and you could just be like, hey, my input is my whole like neural network model file. It's cool, you can do it. Um, and you can do it all in just like one file, maybe two if you're doing a data type. All right, so, Let's talk about how this turns in, like what does the computer do with this information? And now I'm telling you, we're getting in the weeds. I warned you. Um, okay, so we have our graph there. We've seen it before. It's got nodes, it, got, it has arrows, it has edges. Um, under the hood, to be fast, it has to do some tricks, okay? So this graph actually gets turned into that. This is just like an order of operations. First do node A then do node B, then do node C. And instead of actually flowing the data, let's just share it. Let's just use the same thing. Because I don't know if you've ever like copied a folder from one part of your computer to another, and then a little bar comes up. Like that's not okay. Copying is slow, and we don't want to be slow. Now of course, in a computer you're not copying files, you're copying RAM, but uh, it stands. We don't want to be slow. And this is my, okay, now we're nerding out. So I don't know if you've heard these terms before. This is all about being fast. It's L1, L2, L3, cache. I don't know how many Ls they have. They probably have more Ls than three. Um, it does matter what you do with your data when you're writing audio algorithms because your computer is smart. It has this memory that's teeny tiny and it's right next to the like, processor and it's really fast. And then it has something that's a little bigger that's a little slower and it goes on and on until you get to your RAM, which we're probably all pretty aware of, and your hard drive. Uh, and, and this is my example of like, the scale though of how different the speeds are. Okay? So if you're L1 cache, that's the teeniest, teeniest, tiniest one and it's right next to your CPU. And if you can have your data in there, if you can trick the computer to just putting all your audio there, you, you win. So, if you're, so the analogy is if you want to eat an apple, it's like, it's like the apple, you say I want to eat an apple, before you're done, the apple's just like in your mouth. Okay, it's so fast. Now, now L2, pretty reasonable. You want to eat an apple? It's, oh, it's in my hand. Oh. Okay, three, still, you're still kind of good. It's just in the kitchen. You go get the apple. Now here's where it starts to get rough. Four, RAM. We all think RAM's fast, RAM's not fast. RAM's, it's okay. But if, if we're using this app, eating an apple analogy, you gotta get up, get in the car, drive to the store. HD, if you go to the hard drive, just find a different profession, give up. It's not working, because you're in a bad spot. This is like paging in, paging out. If your audio is paging in, and you wanna play it right now, now maybe if you have some scheduler, because there's these things called disk schedulers that DOS use, yeah, okay, so you have to interact with the hard drive. We interact with the hard drive, we stream and stuff. But if you wanna play something and then the computer says, oh, I'm sorry, that's on the hard drive, just give up. Because as far as it goes, it's like you plant the seed for the apple tree, someone waters it all the time, it grows, the bees come by, they pollinate it, it grows an apple, you grab it, you take a bite. So we need to be really cognizant of that since we're talking data flows, okay? We need to think about how is our data flowing. So we share, this is an audio buffer. Each one of these boxes is a little sample. 
these pink boxes are each a little sample. Two nodes will share that, and they'll write to the same one. And they'll go through it in an order. And our computers are smart. They know that, hey, you read sample one. I bet you you're going to read sample two next. So I'm going to get that one ready. And if you go in it in order without doing anything else, your computer will be nice and fast. And the other things that those caches work on is like, how recently did I use that data? Right? So if I don't have to copy this and access one buffer, then access another, I can go faster if I just access the same, because I'm like, oh, you just used that. Actually, I have that in L2 cache. Here you go, super fast. So that, that really went into a deep part of MetaSound's architecture, which was just about speed. And the other thing that we have going on is our sample accurate. Now, we only have two sample accurate data types now. We'll probably get a third to have a gate type. Um, maybe we'll get more. We might have a sample accurate float. We'll see how things go. Uh, but this is how the triggers work. Usually, like we said, because we want to be nice with our cache, we render a big block. Maybe we do, this is kind of your latency trade-off. Maybe you do 32 samples, 64, maybe you do 1,024. Kind of depends on what your tolerance for latency is for your application. But within that, we have a trigger, and it's got individual sample markers. And if we have this like little decay envelope, this little example with the trigger coming in, audio coming out, it makes this graph over here where the blue star is the sample that the trigger happened. And it happens exactly on that sample. And if you take that trigger and hook it up to five other things that listen to trigger, they're all going to do their exact thing at that exact sample. And when their audio comes out, their exact samples are going to line up exactly where you want them to. OK, I told you there's going to be code. This is it. This is, I think this is the only code in the whole presentation. So if you don't know code, that's fine. But I've written a lot of DSP. I like writing DSP. One thing I don't like is screwing up for loops, like counting samples, counting frames. It's easy to screw up. But so we, so we added this little helper thing, this trigger. Here's our trigger. This is that node that I was talking about that we were just looking at, that decay node. This is basically the whole thing, plus a bunch of boilerplate to say what its inputs and outputs are. Um, Triggers organize these frame boundaries for you. So it'll say, hey, do this before, if you haven't seen a trigger yet. So you got to, you know, maybe you're a sine wave and you still render audio. Um, but when a trigger happens, uh, do this. And I'll give you the start and stop frame. You don't even have to think about it. Uh, and so for this one, it's dead simple. Just set the gain to one. And then when you're rendering audio, slowly decay that gain and apply it to the audio. All right, and so kind of the last really important, I think this is the last, yeah, last big architecture thing with MetaSounds was that it needed to have handle wave or like audio samples well, seamlessly. It, you had to be able to add them in and not think about it and not worry about it. And this is where it can lean on all the other bits that are in a game engine. So it leans on the stream caching that's in the audio engine that's there. So you don't have to worry about making sure you have enough memory to play your WAV file. But it also leans on like the people who figure out how to take this, package that with your graphics into a game, and then load it at the right time in the game so it's ready to play when you want to play it. Um, that is all deeply integrated into MetaSounds. So it's not something you have to think about. It's something you get for free. Uh, and that if you had to do it yourself, would be really, really hard. All right, so here we're, we're coming up on the end here. So just to recap, MetaSounds, it's a data flow graph. We have tools it's in UE5. You can download it, you can use it. It's a great way to just do DSP. And it's built off of, I think, a long and hearty tradition of how do we do signal flow, DSP, and make it something that's expressive and fun. And real quick, the future, right now you can make sources, so things that make sounds. You can do that in the, with MetaSounds. But we're going to be moving on. We're going to be doing submix effects, source effects, so just like, hey, can I write an effect? And then can I reuse that effect everywhere? Um, can I interact with um, spatialization algorithms? You know, that's an important part of 
pretending you're in some sort of real 3D space in a game. Um, particle effects, different modulations for just controlling and patching. All these are going to be coming down the pike, as well as just making it faster and making it run on those itty bitty, difficult, tiny CPUs that your game still needs to run on. All right, that's it. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions, comments for Phil? Lawrence? Yeah, I've got kind of a, a stupid question um, based on just because I haven't used these tools yet much. So how does MetaSounds, uh, how is MetaSounds distinguished uh, from what Unreal had uh, before it as, a, as its native audio capacity? Because you could, before MetaSounds, you could still play a WAV file. Yes. In, uh, obviously. So could you... I mean, obviously, this whole presentation was about all the cool things that MetaSounds does, but could you elaborate on the distinctions? A, a yeah, bit? so, so MetaSounds, I would say, is the newest <laughs> thing. But there sure. is um, a large suite of audio tools that uh, exist already. So we have things like, um, first of all, like file playback support, but, but tools for managing uh, concurrency, like how many sounds are playing and when they should stop, when they should start, for routing audio into submixes, for applying effects to those, for dealing with spatialization, for plugging in crazy fancy spatialization algorithms, or using kind of just like some sort of distance attenuation type mm -hmm. thing. Um, I forget, well, visual effects is a whole another thing. So analyzing your audio to power graphics so that you can have some visualization of something that's happening in audio going out. Uh, and then we had, I think, lots of other stuff that Aaron here worked on before, so he would be the expert, I think, in all that. But that's kind of the world it lives in. So right now, MetaSounds is, I want to make my own custom DSP rendering thing. Okay. And my interaction is about mucking with DSP. Or maybe it's like, it can be something fairly simple, like I want to maybe just play around with uh, choosing sound waves but it can be as complicated as then I want to apply a million different things to it in DSP. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'll have That was a good answer, Phil. But you left out a really important legacy thing, which is sound cues. Oh, yeah. So uh, I would say every modern audio engine needs this thing that handles audio objects. Phil's slide mentioned that, an audio object being a, a compositional thing that handles complex interactions between many different sounds, et cetera. That would be on the source generation aspect of what audio engines do. Uh, before MetaSounds, and still, they still exist, is sound cues. Sound cues handled that aspect of the uh, audio engine and Unreal Engine before. Sound cues has a significant number of fundamental day one architectural problems, which prevent it from being able to do 90% of what sound, uh, MetaSounds do. And so they're not a DSP graph. It's just about playing wave files at the top. It, it's sort of authored with a I would say late 90s, early 2000 concept of what game audio can be. In MetaSounds, Phil didn't say this in any of his presentation, but the idea of MetaSounds ultimately is that it's the analog to shaders uh, for graphics to audio. So the idea is that eventually you, it's a fully programmable, deep pipeline. Um, it's already really powerful, but we're going more and more in those kinds of directions. Lots of things that we're doing right now are following in the footsteps of shaders. So sound cues was sort of like mixing and matching and blending textures would be like the sort of analog, while Smetasounds is like all of the power of a modern shader engine, but for audio. That's the sort of, sorry, Phil. But I, no, I, I, no, I okay. talk to licensees all the time, and they ask that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Um, so when you are thinking about developing all of the audio systems that go into Unreal Engine, do you have like sort of an ideal golden workflow that you try and sort of push people to use or build the tools out to work with? Or you know, how do you go about thinking about how users on large scale projects will use your tools at, at scale? Yeah, it, it, you know, there's a lot of different users um, 
for UE. There are folks who are, well, there's learning, uh, but then there's like small teams, indie kind of stuff. And then there's all the way up to your big AAA productions, right? And, and that's a huge span of, of not only just experience, but what they want to get out of the tool. So for someone like a AAA, they're probably going to want to customize a lot of stuff. They're going to have custom workflows. They're going to have tons of custom code. And so we're, you know, somewhat of a tool that is extensible for them, right? Uh, for your novice or maybe small teams, not necessarily novice, you can be not novice at all and be a small team, uh, probably they're looking for something a little more out of the box. Now, we're, I don't think we're... We're making more tools for that out-of-the-box experience, but we're also allowing other people to come in and make that out-of-the-box experience too. Um, there's the marketplace, things like that. So we kind of ride a line a little bit of there. We try and listen to the community and say, okay, okay, are a lot of people really stumbling on this or are a lot of people really asking for an out-of-the-box experience? So, okay, a lot of people are asking for it. Maybe we go ahead and build that kind of very simple, straightforward thing. Um, but I think I think our primary directive is to make tools for people, it, to make tools that can be extended, that can be, that can meld into other workflows and to other teams. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Steve and I have a, a need. <laughs> so I've got an environment, <laughs> right? And I'm uh, dropping video screens in the environment, and I have a master audio that's running, God's Ear View, and I want each of those screens to be sample connected to what's playing. So the, it, it's multiple cameras that were in the place originally, and laying the screens up so that you can walk through and see people playing, and you're hearing the mastered post. Is, have you saved me yet? Is it good? Is it possible? I think we're very, very close. I think there's a way to do it, depending on how deep in the weeds you want to get, yeah. uh, as far as separating out your... I think the thing I worry about most is um, you need the synchronization between the audio, but assuming that you also need it quite tightly with the video. We don't well. have to... It specifically is the video. The video has the same audio, you know, because it's, it's five different video sources of the same time frame. And each of those, it's like people, different different players in a different place in the room. And so you can walk around, hopefully in Oculus, and walk around and look and watch the people playing from wherever they were in the camera. And then hear, at the same time, the people playing. So it's a synchronous, when, when I heard we have sample accurate capability, I'm wondering, is it also frame accurate? Well, if you start the videos at this, the right time with the audio, because the environment's static. Yeah, you can walk around and see this stuff happen. So, we so there we do have other technologies for kind of um, sample accurate beginning of sounds. So if if starting it at the same time or right. scheduling it, and then enough. pausing, you know, and being able to stop yes. and start again, and so while you're or continue something called Quartz, actually Max here is probably something you want to talk to. So if you're trying to coordinate multiple sounds to happen at the same, like multiple sources mm -hmm. to happen at the same time, that quartz is probably your way to go. Is that quartz as in the... Like a quartz, the crystal. Crystal like yeah. time. Yeah. Exactly. Ah. Uh, and so if you are doing sample accurate stuff in a meta sound, all the sample accurate stuff kind of has to be inside that one meta sound. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is where you would maybe run into an issue depending on how your stuff is laid out. A video trigger start maybe is what we need and have the audio start at the same time and then let it all freewheel, hopefully. Yeah, or just have the video follow the audio is really the trick. You have audio clock, you tell that video, no, 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 no. Yeah, follow. You, you follow. Brilliant, because this has been my desire for a long time and some people know what we're talking about and it's exciting and I'm really happy we're getting closer tapping our feet for like 30 years and everything will be fine. Um, <laughs> I have a follow up for me. Do you want to Go talk up? to the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on up. So we do have a team uh, called the Media Framework Team, which handles a lot of the media decoding and playback. One of the uh, 
media innovations they've done is this thing called the Electra player, which El Electra, which allows you to actually stream video content over the internet live and then have it render in the engine live and have the audio come out live and be spatialized and all this stuff. We've done that in Fortnite uh, on a couple of occasions in the last couple years. I think the biggest problem will be trying to synchronize multiple video players and multiple tracks, all of them working. If they're, oh, yeah, if it's, if, it's a live concert. well, that should be really easy, actually. I think it should yeah, be really I think it should be. Good. So we, Max uh, is our uh, former Digipen graduate, uh, who's actually the owner. Uh, still in, a graduate. Sorry, <laughs> former Digipen student. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't. You revoked his uh, degree. I get it. Uh, but anyways. Um, uh, so he's someone you can talk with about how to hook, hook that up with Quartz. Quartz is a really exciting thing. Phil didn't talk about it, but it is, it is sort of our solution for uh, having sort of video frame or game frame events, uh, schedule events uh, in the audio renderer at the exact time that you want to schedule them. And it's a, some really nice tricks, and it does align. Something Phil didn't bring up, um, which is important, is that that on begin play trigger in Metasounds um, is a trigger and the sample that that on begin play happens in the larger audio renderer is sample accurate. So if you start a meta sound using quartz and you want to start multiple meta sounds using quartz, all of those triggers do line up on the exact sample index. So once those sounds start, they will maintain their sample accuracy inside the meta sound. And so all of the internal events and triggers and these kinds of things uh, will maintain their accuracy. So as long as the sounds start at the same time with quartz, they'll, ma they'll keep being at the same time. Um, and a couple other things, just to throw them out there as stuff to look into. You probably don't have time to get into it, but we have uh, an idea called an audio bus, which allows you to route audio arbitrarily around. We've added support for reading and writing to them in Metasounds, so you can write into an audio bus and read from them. And coming up, we've got some stuff that's uh, going to allow you to write out of the Metasound to communicate back into the game. Things like the uh, amplitude of your meta sound or any kind of intra sound events that you want to synchronize to uh, video or graphics events. And uh, we have a plugin called Synesthesia, which Phil uh, is the sort of owner of that, which gives you a lot of non real time analysis capabilities and now some uh, real time analysis capabilities that are further tools that allow a sort of audio visual uh, interaction. So, Synesthesia, where you blend. Um, Sensors together, sensory input together is the sort of name of the game of that space. We're really deep in it, and uh, anyways, stuff to think about. Do we have any questions online? Please unmute your mic and turn your camera on, and I'll stop the share when I hear you. Any more questions in the room? Here comes one. Hi, um, you had a slide about uh, extending meta sounds in C++. I'm interested to learn more about that. Like each of your meta sounds components, is that is there like a corresponding class in C++ that you could use in a similar way? Yeah, uh, extending it is more or less, I don't really have quite the data here to show it, but um, it's you extend a class, right? And you fulfill, sure. I think it's just like four functions. Basically, one for your execute, which is just like what happens on an audio render block. Um, one to do your, describe your inputs and outputs. Um, one to actually connect your inputs and outputs. And then a creation one, which is like, how do I create myself? Uh, so C++, you know, allocation type thing. Uh, and that's it. So online in github you know the so ue's source code is open uh it's not open source open source but um you can look at it on github if you accept the eula uh, and i think we have quite a few examples online already so if you look for metasound c++ you should be able to come across something where they have it laid out for you exactly how to do it it, it more or less fits in one cpp and it's just a couple functions you override Conceptually, is, is this a way of um, building one of those graphs we saw in code, or, or is it more low, low level, like you're 
building an individual component. It's like your an individual node, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is you can we have had you can do it in C plus plus too. You can build a C plus plus representation of graph mm. and then wrap it in a node and set, like we've mm -hmm. had people do that in house already. Mm -hmm. uh, generally though when we're extending it, it's you're gonna be more optimized if you just say, hey, I'm writing my node. Uh, gotcha. plus, so it can figure it. So the compiler can do a lot of work for you, basically. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Just one more. Thing. Sorry. I probably should have looked at uh, Phil's slides. So um, if you are you if you're on Google, you can just search for Epic Developer Community. Uh, it's probably the best place to go. So EDC Epic Developer Community. There's a whole bunch of tutorials uh, that various folks have written about writing nodes from scratch in C plus plus. Just recommend it. I have a question. Uh, you brought up the concept of a flow graph. Could you describe uh, an alternative to that paradigm and why it was not desirable for MetaSense? Uh, yeah, so let's, this is probably a good one. Um, the other one is the uh, con control graph, I guess. So, so right now, when you draw a line, you're saying, where should the data flow? Um, if you look at like normal visual scripting stuff, that's not audio, that's other scripting stuff, it's a control flow. You're saying, I want my control to start here, and then I'm saying what to do next. That's what the arrow says. OK, it says, do that next. And then the arrow might come back here and say, do this next, and then do this next. Um, that, the, the main reason why you go with a flow graph is because you're dealing with a lot of data. Because you don't want to have to make all those decisions for every audio sample. Because um, like I said, how memory is laid out, if you have to go chasing three different nodes for every sample, that's a lot of memory loading and unloading, and eventually it slows down your computer um, through all the extra memory access that it has to do. And it doesn't allow you to do things like SIMD, right, where you say, okay, let's do four or eight samples at a time. Uh, so if you, th there's other stuff like, um, uh, what's Faust? Is Faust the one? That's one where, I guess it's more of, a, I think they, there they're a little bit more flexible um, where they can actually like pump out C++, right? And then compile that and do all this optimization. With this tool, we didn't want to have that be part of the workflow. Also, that's a big tech thing that you have to like carry around and like support forever and it slows down all the other features that you'd like to do. Um, and so that really wasn't, high on our list is like options of how to implement this. So we said, okay, don't do control flow. Don't, don't allow that crazy logic. Have it fast by keeping it as a flow graph so you can do everything in a friendly way with your CPU and your uh, computer's memory. So to follow up on that, um, so this is a good kind of a basic uh, uh, thing for me to understand uh, this at a much sort of more basic level. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So, Flow graph, which you're showing here, the flow literally is a digital signal, right? This is what's flowing through the, the lines of meta sounds is literally a bit stream of, of, of instantaneous amplitudes of the digital signal at that moment. Is that correct? I mean, is, it, is that what your flow is? is, it, is yeah. As opposed to in Blueprint, which is, a, is it correct that Blueprint is a control yeah. graph? And yeah. that's control data, which is not digital signal data. So this is the computer has to, what, depending on what it's telling it to do, has to do something entirely different. Is that, do I, do I understand the difference correctly? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, you can imagine in a flow graph, so there's a difference between like this conceptual, like what is the concept that we're given to the person who's using this language to describe their sound. Mm -hmm. There's that, that's a flow graph. Then there's some details. <laughs> You okay. know, things have to happen in order on a computer. And, um, but if we talk about the conceptual stuff, which is really, I think, what's most yeah. important, yeah. is these two could happen at the same time, you know? That's a flow graph. With uh, a blueprint control graph, it's one thing happening at a time. There's an order to it all. 
and that order is about a sequence of events. This is uh. about like, where is the data going? Where does the data need to be for the next thing to happen? Okay. So, so cool. it's just a change of focus, you know? Yeah. Can I add to that just briefly? Yeah. Uh, so I think with, this is a huge deal and I'm glad Max brought it up because it is a point of um, confusion for users when they first come into MetaSounds especially because our triggers kind of look like blueprint execute pins. So people start doing it thinking like, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. And they get confused because the order is not at all what they're, they're, they're thinking of it the wrong way. The better way to think about medicine, we tried to make it a little bit different <laughs> than an execute pin, but it's still white. It still has a, but um, anyways, uh, the best way to think about metasounds is approach it like you would modular synthesis, like as if it's analog don't think about it in terms of any, just like in modular synthesis, you might have a thing that's like this happens and this happens, but in a way it is just a data flow. When you're doing modular synthesis, it is data. With triggers and events and gates and these kinds of things, you can start getting into logical stuff like you can with modular synthesis. Like I'm really into it. You can get into this sort of compositional logic, like things are happening and then if I do this, it does this but it's a different paradigm than literally this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and you, you like break point through. Um, you know, like you can literally step through and know exactly what happens. Metasounds under the hood really does have an order. It is doing a thing. It's really execute the parent or the, yeah, the parent first to go to the child, et cetera. There is an order, but that is pretty much the only order you should be thinking about. So there is an order, just like there is a modular synthesis, but you should be really thinking about it as a simultaneously almost analog-esque uh, data flow. Is that a good answer, Phil? Yeah. yeah. Philip, there was a question online that I'm just seeing now. For a beginner, what are your suggestions on how to learn to use Unreal Engine MetaSound? What information would you need to know before you jump into this world? Um, probably... I would say just learning Unreal Engine, like not learning, learning the whole thing, but just getting used to like how content is managed, how to open it up, how to make a map. Um, those are to me the harder parts uh, because they're just idiosyncratic. You know, they're part of the game engine and all the details that you have to do there. Uh, as far as learning how to use MetaSounds, um, the trick is to just get that first step. So the one hard part about learning MetaSounds as a beginner is it gives you the blank canvas. It gives you that thing that you hit play, it makes no sound. <laughs> and so just making sure you know how to take, maybe just a you type, right click, type in sign, and a sign node comes up and taking that audio and connecting it to the output and get that going. And then the rest of it, you can kind of just play around. I mean, playing with it is really, I think, the ultimate way to learn how to do it because um, there's just a lot of tricks, a lot of weird things you can do. And of course, there's example content if you wanted to go download. Uh, Lyra um, is available. I think we have a bunch of games and you can basically go in the editor, say, search for meta sounds in the little content browser there and then you'd have tons of content to look at. Um, thanks for the presentation. I had a question um, kind of following up on what was spoken about earlier about like data flow and the difference between control um, versus what was the, the one that this is a... Uh, data flow. Flow Full graph. graph yeah. Okay. Um, when you were talking about low frequency oscillators in your meta sound earlier, you were talking about the speed of computation of the low frequency oscillator. And it sounded almost like there was a paradigm of like a control rate versus audio rate. And I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that. Does meta sounds uh, use a control rate versus audio rate kind of paradigm like we see in other languages? Yeah. Um... I think effectively you could say yes, you know, and, and we try and work around it basically. Uh, so control rate is, oh, let's, let's go back to this one. This is probably a good one to describe control rate. So when one of these nodes does its thing, it does it on 
let's say, let's just use 100 samples for an example. So it's going to do it on that whole 100 samples, right? And when it is told, hey, compute the next 100 samples, it is given, if it has like a float and an audio as an input, let's say those were its two inputs, a float and an audio buffer, it would be given one float value. Let's say that was your gain. And it would be given 100 audio samples. And it, that float value wouldn't change for the whole 100 audio samples. So every 100 audio samples, that float value might. So that would be your block rate. So whatever your sample rate is divided by 100. Uh, I think MetaSounds by default right now runs at 100 hertz. So it'll, the control rate will be 100 hertz. Um, things like triggers get around that. So because we enforce this acyclic nature of it, we can ensure that things are sample accurate wherever you route that trigger, even though we're doing it on 100 samples at a time, okay? For a thing like float, that is not sample accurate. So that's going to be stuck on that boundary. Um, lots of the data types are that way. But I think it's, it's trigger, audio are the two. And I'm, we're going to add a gate one of these days, I swear. <laughs> so like an on off, that sample accurate. Uh, we may even add a sample accurate float. It's not um, rocket science to do it. The cost to making everything sample accurate is um, within your node having to deal with that. Okay, so here I just have one thing that needs to switch per sample. And so I can write this tight loop. The computers love little tiny loops like that that only deal with two numbers and do 100 samples at a time. But if I added in three other things that happen sample accurate, I'm going to take this frame range, you know, start to stop, and I'm going to make a lot of teeny tinier chunks. And as you kind of subdivide it more and more, it gets more costly. So I think we need to play around with where that boundary makes sense. Any more questions? Online people? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Before we uh, grab water or cookies, we have that stuff for you. Um, can we get a count of people who are AES members? And Lawrence, would you count? Please, looks like five of us. Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six in the room here. And I can check online just who attended and see that. So let's take five or ten and grab a cookie. Lawrence, do you want to put them up? Can we eat in here? Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, there's free. What yes. Uh, having people introduce themselves and say where they are from and what they do in audio. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you in 10. We can get back to it here. Back to the meeting. Um, All right. <laughs> let's uh, start with online folk. And what we like to do is ask you to identify yourself, first of all, leave your mic and uh, or at least your video on for now. You might want to turn your mic off if you're not actually talking. Uh, and I'll call on you and please tell us where you are, what you're up to, and uh, what your audio connection is. And I'm going to start with the online folk. And let me get my glasses here. Uh, Zihan Zhao, are you able to unmute? and tell us where you are and what your audio connection is. Zihan? Okay, Vebev, I know where you are and I know that you can unmute. Could you tell us where you are and what your audio deal is? Of course, um, hey Dan, uh, <laughs> I haven't seen you in a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I am Vebhav from New Delhi, India and I'm a recording and mixing engineer and um, I'm currently working in Atmos. <laughs> um, 
these days I've been really, really involved with the two film projects that I've come across, uh, doing the complete sound, including all the ADR for n- n- both the films, which was <laughs> a task, let's say. But yeah, finished that up and I'm currently doing the sound design and uh, will be mixing it within the next two days or some. Cool. Thanks for being with us again. Of course. Thanks for having me. Uh, Steve, I saw you on the screen a lot during the break. Where are you and what are you up to? Steve Savanyu. I'm I'm muting. There we go. I'm Steve Savanyu. I am in Northeast Ohio, um, where it's starting to get nice weather for for a change. I am a recording engineer. Uh, I've been in the audio industry for well over 50-some years, uh, way older than I look. I'm uh, primarily classical, jazz, recording. I have a studio in my home, which is what you're seeing in my background. And uh, I just finished uh, Brahms' Requiem with the Akron Symphony, uh, recorded that last week. And I'm off to do sound. Well, I do a lot of live sound as well. I'm doing live sound tomorrow for a high school graduation boring but it's you know it's a live sound gig <laughs> and i'm an aes member uh, i'm part of the ohio chapter but i come to the pacific northwest ones whenever i can get out here even though it's bedtime for me but it's so much fun to see you guys and pacific northwest has got amazing programs unfortunately i was late coming to this one i was loading a truck and so i was I was a little busier than I thought I'd be, but I got caught the tail end of the, the meta thing. It was kind of fascinating to listen to that, that whole. And then when he put the code on the screen, it went right over my little blonde head. So, And thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for being with us. And to be clear, what's behind you is not a pic, not a photo, right? That's Well, it is, it is actually a photo of the studio set up in nightclub mode. I, ah, normally, okay. don't, I don't really, normally don't keep it in nightclub mode. Ah, okay. Uh, I just try, I'll just... I'll turn it off and you can see what's <laughs> behind me. Uh, where's none? Yeah, you can see the analog control room, which I don't uh. really use that much anymore, and the uh, video workstations to my left. But I think the uh, the uh, the studio itself is this, and in nightclub mode, I bring like a 17-piece big band and set it up as a stage and sound system and stage lighting, and I can get about 70 80 piece? people. 17. 17, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can get about 80 people in the house, wow. uh, 40 on the lower level and 40 upstairs. The talkers go upstairs so they can talk and not interfere with the music, <laughs> and they watch it on a big screen TV. And uh, the music aficionados sit downstairs where they're quiet while the band plays. I, I enforce that rule very strongly. Awesome, thanks. Thank we'll you. One more online here, and then we'll go in room. So someone stand by at the microphone. Long thing. Uh, Rolando, Rolando, are you able to unmute and talk to us? Yes. Are you? Nope. Are you there? Rolando, you said earlier. I think thanks from Buena. No, no, that was somebody else. Oh, I'm here. There you are. Good. Hey, how are you doing? I'm all right. Good. Where are you? Um, I am from San Francisco. I am an AES student, so right. I'm just still learning uh, about what the sound. What do you sound do in world. audio? I'm still a student. I'm in. Been I did most of the stuff in my local community college, mm-hmm. as far as I can with the courses they offered. Um, but I'm now I'm like learning more about the film world. Is that what you're production. interested in? Uh, I think I'm more into the design. System I'm, I'm design more of the, or? Um, probably like sound design, system design. Uh-huh. I like... One moment, I gotta close the door. Okay. This is fun. I like it when somebody goes off and grabs something and says, hey, look at this. Ah. <laughs> uh. Sorry, I had a noisy room, uh, oh. roommate next door. <laughs> oh, fooey. I thought, okay. So you were hearing a lot of background noise. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, and I'm finding out I am more of a design programmer. I like doing the little things like I was uh, interested in Unreal Sound Engine, but also I'm interested in the visual aspect of it as well. So I kind of want to learn both. 
okay the visual and the sound effect design um yeah it's, it's like i'm kind of figuring out where i want to specialize in mm -hmm. i'm i'm more like being more of a hybrid that's what i'm finding out <laughs> cool like it's 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 like i i've been through the recording studios i've been to that and did and tried it out but i'm like more like the editor role and more of the designer of it and i think i'm playing that also with the film so it's it's i'm still trying to figure out what i want to put my foot in my toe into but I'm more of a. I'm still searching. I'm figuring out where I want my where I want to go. I'm I'm just like dipping my toe almost at everything now. That's but great. I, One of the things that I loved being a student was that every quarter you could be do a specialist in something different, and explore these things to find out if you want them or not. So congratulations to you. That's, yeah, it seems wonderful. like Unreal has a little bit of everything I want to do. So I'm kind of going to focus on that this summer. Good for you. So this was helpful to you. Yes, because there's not too many presentations on the sound version of Unreal and what it can do. There's a lot of the modeling that Maxon did with ZBrush with their the visual aspect of Unreal. All right. Well, thank you. All right, thank um, you. Let's go into in room here, and it's a little bit of a hassle to uh, make this transition but we'll do this every time and lawrence i see you're there go ahead oh hold it go ahead do no. i need to oh there it no, is you do. I, I do to do anything i'm lawrence schwedler i'm the director of the music and sound design programs here at uh, digipen institute in redmond washington and i also am the treasurer of the pacific northwest section of the aes along with dan and everybody else who's uh, on that awesome section that puts on these cool meetings all right, thank you. Let's go to the other side. Uh, hello, my name is Eric Liebubon Gunderson. I'm a student here for the uh, music and sound design program. Uh, I'm in my, I just finished my junior year. Uh, I've worked on two games so far. Uh, I'm a sound designer and musician for games. Yeah, thanks for Great. having me. Great, thank you. And a damn you. good composer, too. <laughs> and a damn good composer, Lawrence says. All right, thanks. thanks for joining us. Steve on the other side there. Hello, I'm Steve Turnage. I'm a mastering engineer and circuit board designer, and uh, I've been involved with the AAS thing a, a lot. And uh, things are coming into existence that I've been waiting for about 30 years, and now just finding how to uh, keep riding the tiger, basically, and maintaining music and sanity at the same time. OK, great. And now house right person, and then we'll go back online. Hey, I'm Noah Ladoff. I'm a uh, recent DigiPen alum. Uh, I do mostly technical sound design and uh, also some sound design on the side. Uh, last summer I was at uh, 343 Industries working on Halo Infinite, which was a lot of fun. I was doing a lot of uh, implementing acoustics and, and uh, adaptive mixing and supporting levels and things that are, have yet to come out. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Cool, thanks for joining us. Okay, let me stop sharing here and go back online. And please, Rick Lambright, are you able to unmute and talk to us? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I, we moved down here to retire just uh, about four or five years ago, but I was up in Seattle for 29 years, 25 of it uh, doing game development and co-founding game companies. And in the early days, even writing game music with, uh, believe it or not, the DOS version of Cakewalk. We're talking way, way, way back, so. Cool, there were chuckles. And, Where is here? Where are so I, I'm in uh, uh, the Palm Springs area and Rancho Mirage and, and trying to retire again, but I'm currently the technical advisor for the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. So I'm writing a lot of pro bono code for them. My background awesome. is in software engineering. Awesome. Are you a web page person too? I was a, uh, no, I was a uh, server developer for, and we mostly, what I worked on was massively multiplayer games like the Matrix Online. I was actually the serving, the back end lead, the overall engineering lead, and I designed the server system for that. So quite a few different companies doing mostly back end stuff. That's what I got in the industry to do. Awesome. 
Well, thanks for joining us. Oh, and I say I used to live about a half a mile from the original DigiPen, over uh, not far from Nintendo and that in the original DigiPen location. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. right there. Over by the 7-Eleven? <laughs> you know, the other side. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, who's next here? Janie Wallach. Where are you and what's your audio deal? Uh, I'm in Seattle, Washington, and I record live music. And I have a busy weekend coming up. Well, at least um, I'm for sure recording uh, tomorrow night. Um, at this point, I would say Saturday is less likely. But uh, next weekend, it's going to be Saturday, Sunday, Monday, more likely than not, because it's Memorial Day weekend and there is a four day uh, festival here in the Seattle area. So I'm probably going to just camp out there. And <laughs> that's like my largest festival of the whole year. And then yeah. I'll have a sigh of relief when it's done. <laughs> is that cool. folk life? Huh? Is it folk life? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, Janie. Uh, Fernando, where are you and what's your audio deal? Are you able to unmute? Possibly not. Fernando? Okay. Cornelia, are you able to unmute and talk yes. to us? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Cornelia. I'm a uh usually like uh, study in in Germany tone meister like uh recording sound engineering stuff like that a lot of uh jazz and classical music um but currently since last year September uh I make uh, I'm doing a an exchange year here in Japan um yeah and dipping my toes a little bit into like game sound sound design uh, and game sound composing and stuff like that. Great. Thanks for joining us. We'll do one more and then go back to in the room here. Uh, and, and Dan, uh, Fernando wrote, uh, is, oh, is writing something at the in the chat. Uh, okay, yes. Oh, sorry, too late here in Buenos Aires. Everybody's sleeping at home. And thanks for responding, Janie. Uh, so when Fernando says something, I'll have you read it, uh, but we'll go back after Carl. Are you able to unmute and talk to us, Carl Howard? Apparently not. Rick, Jin, uh, where are you and uh, what's your audio deal? I'm in, uh, I'm in Sammamish, which is a suburb of Seattle and across Lake Sammamish from Microsoft. Uh, what's my deal? Uh, well, I'm a life member of the AES. I'm the section webmaster and I'm looking for a replacement. Um, and audio wise, I do um, recording, mostly classical and jazz. And I'm uh, an escaped live sound engineer. <laughs> I also do a certain amount of circuit design and circuit board layout and other things. I kind of have my hands everywhere, which is maybe good and bad. Anyway. And you've got an incredible library that you've been happy to share with people of manuals and schematics and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's going to have to find a home at some point in time. Hmm. Uh, my ch my children are after me to thin the herd. <laughs> Good luck with that, man. Uh, yeah, well, I've I've seen some uh, examples in real time of people that have uh, left the planet and left a um, collection behind for yep. the years. Yeah. And uh, th they've got my attention, but I'm not sure what to do about it. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks for everything you've done for us. OK, we're back in the room here now. And somebody please go up to the microphone and tell us uh, where, what you're up to, Greg. Um, Dan? Yes, Rick. Uh, when you get a, a a moment like maybe after this introduction, um, I'd like to say something about the web position. Okay, let's let Greg talk first. <clears throat> um, hello, everybody. My name is Greg Dixon. Um, I am an assistant professor of music and sound design here at DigiPen Institute of Technology, and um, I am a composer and sound designer and. Um, 
uh, audio engineer and a former chair of the Pacific Northwest AES. Um, I'm currently serving as a committee member for the Pacific Northwest AES, and I'm just really happy to be here um, again here at DigiPen, here with you all. Um, and I'm excited about our meeting next month here as well, and really excited about the future um, <clears throat> of the Pacific Northwest AES. Uh, so thank you. Great, thanks, Greg. Rick, can I have you hold? Because it's a pain in the ass the way I've got this set up to go back and forth. So. Yeah, sure. OK. Uh, next, on screen, go ahead. Uh, I'm Caleb Kingsford. I'm uh, going to my get, senior Get closer to the front of the mic, please. There you go. I'm Caleb Kingsford. I'm uh, going to my senior year here at DigiPen in the computer science and digital audio program. Uh, I'm currently an intern at a, com a game company called Midwinter Entertainment. They're owned by Behavior Interactive. They're very cool. We're doing cool stuff. Uh, and recently, I have been working on a project in Metasounds, which is why I was here today, um, making a wavetable synthesizer with Metasounds stuff, mixing between sine wave, uh, sine saw, square, triangle, the classics, uh, and having fun controls for that to be able to make cool sounds in Metasounds. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. On the other side. Hi, I'm David Schneider. Um, I have a background as a composer. I did that for a long time. Um, and then I started to get into computer music, and via that, I discovered a love of um, programming. Um, and now I'm a full-time software engineer. I just started a new job at uh, Unity, and uh, really excited about it to be working on a game engine. Um, someday I, I'm looking for a way to tie all of the things that I've done together, the music, the, the technology. I haven't found it yet. All right, cool. Thanks, David. Hi, I'm, uh, okay. You're fine, Hi. go ahead. Okay, I'm Harrison Geralt Jones. Uh, I recently graduated uh, with a bachelor's in the music and sound design program here at DigiPen. Uh, last summer, I did an internship uh, at Source Sound down in LA uh, doing sound design. I've discovered that I'm happiest when I get to do a little bit of music here, a little bit of sound design there, a little bit of dialogue. I just enjoy touching everything. <laughs> and uh, yeah. All right, great, thanks. Uh, switch here first. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Larson. I am a rising junior here at DigiPen Institute of Technology. Uh, I also have a previous um, degree in computer science from a college out in Minnesota. Um, and I've been, I've been doing audio my whole life. Uh, I, I think I can consider myself a composer and sound designer now. Um, and yeah, I'm really, really interested in, in audio technology, um, live sound, just, just everything. Um, so I'm just trying to get elbows deep in as much of it as I can. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks for your great work running a camera today. Eric, you want to go ahead? Hi, uh, my name is Eric Caden. I also graduated uh, from DigiPen a month ago, and uh, I'm looking uh, forward to working in the games industry. Cool, thank you. Thanks for your help today. Hi, I'm Ben Schwedler. I'm a BSCSDA here at DigiPen. Going to my fifth year, uh, I recently just finished uh, my junior year-long project working in Metasounds as the tech director for our team. Uh, we use Metasounds to, as our entire audio engine, we use it to implement all music and sound effects in our game, and it was it was a lot of fun to use, um, and it was a big learning experience, and I'm very proud of it. It should be our game, Inner Spark, should be up on Steam, and the other by the end of the summer. And when he, they announced an upcoming feature, you were really excited about that. What was that? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, one thing that I wished for in my project was the ability for, um, for Metasounds to be able to communicate, um, to correspond with the gameplay thread and use Metasounds outputs to affect the actual gameplay. And that was one thing that um, Aaron mentioned 
is an upcoming feature of Unreal 5.3 that I'm very much looking forward to. Yeah, Aaron, you made somebody really happy here tonight. Thank you. Okay, go to the other side, please. And thanks, Ben, for your help today. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my Hi. name is James Kent. I just completed my first year in the music and sound design nice. Thank program you. here at DigiPen. Um, I haven't really decided what kind of thing I want to specialize into, but I think interactive, in, interactive music is pretty cool. Um, so I might look more into that in the future, but for now I'll just keep doing a little bit of everything and it's fun. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Max Van Gennekin. Um, I'm a senior here at DigiPen uh, in the BA MSD program, the Music and Sound Design. Um, I do game sound, live audio, tracking, mixing, mastering, editing, dialogue. Uh, and modular synthesis. Yeah, synthesis, <laughs> sound design. Uh, so hit me up. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, actually want to try to um, revisit Metasounds since I was prototyping an ambient system in Metasounds uh, for my game uh, that I'm working on, um, which hopefully will be up on Steam in December. Um, yeah, really excited about that. Great, thanks for sharing that with us. Hey, August? Hello, I am August McCubbin. I am the Sound Lab Manager here at DigiPen uh, and manager of the wonderful student team that has been helping run this. Um, Yay! Give them a little round of applause. Uh, I graduated from DigiPen about two years ago now and have been doing audio programming and got my degree in audio programming from here. So. Awesome, thank you. Is that everybody in the room? Is, is there anybody who hasn't spoken yet? We would like to hear from you if, if not. Okay. Uh, I just got asked about myself, and uh, I don't have a. Oh yeah, I do have a camera. Here. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am a 30-some year member of the committee here. I do live sound as my profession. I started off as a lighting guy, but got into sound because it's more complicated, and this is my 50th year come September of being in the lives, having my own live sound company, and it's still a gas. I really enjoy it, and I really learn a lot, something every time I do it, and have kind of branched out into this Zoom and video stuff, too, and uh, am very pleased to say that uh, through a weird combination of circumstances, I'm in charge of the AES's uh, oral history project and have been since almost the start of the pandemic. And it is a interview, uh, w a recorded interview with people whose careers have been significant in audio. And uh, if you look on the AES website, you have to be a member to see them all, but there's two minute segments of almost all of the interviews, and there's like 115 that some other people did a, a long time ago with really, really influential people, uh, Les Paul and, and uh, I can't think, I'm thinking about this meeting now, I can't think about that too much, but it's really cool, and at the AVAR that was here in this room, in this building two, a year ago, I got to interview a half a dozen people who, for an hour or so apiece, and hear their life stories and, and coax them out. And uh, there is a conference starting in, on June 1st in Culpeper, Virginia, at the Library of Congress for archiving and restoration and preservation of audio, where the significant people there, I'm gonna to get to interview 11 of them, I think, and it's over three days, and I'm really excited about it. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with you and uh, appreciative to DigiPen and to 
everyone on Zoom and everybody in person here for being part of this. So uh, thanks. Anybody else want to say anything here? We did have another comment. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, on, let me on, go back to you. Yeah. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Oh, we had a comment in the chat from uh, Zian. Okay. Good. I, I don't know. It's, can can you come off mute, uh, Zian? Am I am I saying your name right, or am I? I'm probably butchering it, aren't it's like I? Zian, maybe. Zian, Zian. Well, anyway. In anyway. Go ahead. He says, yeah, oh, in China, immersive is a hot topic at the in, in the industry, so he hopes to learn more related knowledge. All right. Thanks for being with us. Are you in China right now? Are you able to tell us that? Um, he said earlier that he's an audio engineer from China and uh, his work scope includes esports and other sound productions. Cool. Thanks, Cornelia. Uh, and uh, Rick had a thing to talk about the web page, web person job. Um, so this is a volunteer position and currently the pages involve writing in a language that is um, dates back to the early days of Unix, uh, NROF, TROF. It's a markup text formatter, uh, something that I created because it was easier than writing HTML because I'm lazy. But uh, you could, if somebody took the, the job over, they could switch to writing just straight in HTML. Um, my method gives uh, really compact pages that load fast and don't have a lot of garbage. Um, but there's nothing that would stop you from using like Microsoft Word and saving as HTML. At some point in the future, the society is probably going to make the sections use something called a content management system, which means that uh, you kind of have a system of little boxes that you could just shove plain text or images in. And there's some, uh, some magical formula, so you know which boxes take text, which boxes take images, and that'll make the, the front page of our website. And then uh, we'll have to do some some magic to connect it to the back page pages, which have all the archive material in it. Anyway, if this is something that's of interest to you, there's a uh, there's a, a PDF document on the main website, and I welcome anyone who wants to talk further about this to get in touch with me, and I can be found via the website. All right, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to say that they'd like to share with this group? All right. Well, I think we'll call it a day then. And uh, thank you, everyone. I, I always love hearing what everyone is up to. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, the fact that we can interact across the entire world like this in real time is still mind-boggling to me. So uh, thank you. And uh, let's call it a day, a day. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Oscillator. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>